Grace to you and peace from God our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. We're gathered for a response and conversation uh, video about last Sunday's lesson. It was on Matthew 10, starting uh, with verse 40. It was the continuation of three weeks of conversation from Matthew's gospel about uh, Jesus sending out of the apostles and us and about what we could expect being sent into the world uh, and what we could expect uh, at living as God's elect in the world. And so the verses that we had for this week were the culmination of that. Let's remind ourselves together you know, what they were, and then let's get into the conversation part. So Jesus says, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, so, uh, again, people wrote in, people had uh, comments, and I am incredibly grateful for those of you who are taking the time and making the effort. And my assumption is if you have questions, others do too. So any of you who have been watching these videos and who have thought, now oh, that's too low, too simple uh, a question, I don't want anyone to know that, that I don't know this, please, I invite you into this game. So there was, there was talk about rewards. You can't read the lesson, right? The word reward is in it all through. That you receive a profit, you get a profit's reward, you receive a righteous person, you receive a righteous person's award, you give a cup of cold water to the least of Jesus' disciples, you'll never lose your reward. But there were some among us that were uncomfortable with that. That this is a love relationship between us and God, right? And we shouldn't be thinking about rewards that are there grades in heaven are there classes of people in heaven and different people expressed in different ways but the the concern was the same that heaven in some ways would be the same sort of uh, they would have the same sort of strata that we find here which we find so uncomfortable and so unjust and so oppressive and is heaven just a bigger and more permanent place where, where the same sickness dwells. Wouldn't it be better if we didn't talk about rewards at all, if we just talked about love? These are, these are excellent questions. And we just have to be clear that there's lots of talk in, in the scriptures about rewards. And not just from the writers of the New Testament, but from Jesus, as in this lesson, from Jesus' own mouth, that, that there is talk about rewards for faithful living, for faithful conduct, for faithful speech. And there are condemnations and costs that are incurred when our conduct and our speech are unfaithful. And that, that if the word reward makes you uncomfortable, you might spend some time with the word consequences. But we're not going to be able to bury rewards entirely. There is something here for us to think about, but it's, it's important that we get clear what we're talking about exactly. First, that, that this pursuit of, of righteousness or this taking our place in the kingdom of light, it's not paramutual betting. You're, you're aware that when you go to a, a, a track and bet on a horse race that you're betting against everyone else in the stands uh, and that the person who's receiving the bets, he takes a cut and then the, the, the winnings come from the pockets, from the hands of the losers. And it's very easy for us to slip into this thing that, that the relationship with God is a zero-sum game, that some of us are winners and others of us are losers, and that if I am to be rewarded, there is a diminishment in what's available to you. That's not it at all. Right? The scripture says that God wishes that none would perish, but all would have eternal life. 
This is a different thing than the reward structures that you're accustomed to in this world. This is a different thing from the reward structure at work that's meant to pull even more out of you. This is a giving of grace, a piling on, a heaping of grace. And it's a warning that how we live matters. What we say matters. How we use our time matters. Uh, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, remember the Corinthians were just a mess. This little church was ripping itself up. Uh, they had all kinds of stuff going on. They were fighting, <coughs> pardon me, they were fighting about the sacraments. They were fighting about uh, divisions in the church. There was rampant sexual immorality in their midst. And they were picking up sides in the church that, that some of them would say that they followed this teacher but not that, or they followed this teacher, not that. They had parties, you know, that, that, that some said, I belong to Paul. Some said, I belong uh, to Peter. Some say, I belong to Apollos. Some said, I belong to Christ. You know, that, that they'd taken the name of Christ and made it into a political party. And Paul was horrified by these divisions. Horrified that they would use him in this contest, in this bashing of one another. And so uh, he responds to them that, you know, I did my part, right? Cephas did his part. Apollos did his part. Christ did everything. What's wrong with you? And then he says this, if you want to look it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. But what has been built, if what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Well, that's a, that's a very helpful way to think about this. That everything you do and everything I do will be revealed, will be known, will be shown on the last day. And what's at issue isn't whether or not you or I wind up inside the kingdom of light. For Jesus' sake and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. You're in. But what you do now that you're in, what I say now that I'm in, matters. And there will be consequences. There will be a revelation our works will be known, and some of us will be in as through fire, and some of us will be celebrated. The reward is not a bigger house in heaven. It's not that the gold streets in front of that house will be burnished by the people who just barely made it in while you sit and take your ease and watch them labor. The reward is to enjoy the delight of the Trinity. Any of us who are parents get this. When our children misbehave, they're not out. But we can be really disappointed and really sad and really angry about their conduct, about their speech, right? We're horrified sometimes. But the child is always our child. And when a child lives to their fullest potential, when they live into our highest impulses and our, 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 our best family rules, it's not that you give the child a thousand dollars while the others look on and gnash their teeth. You hug the child and you kiss the top of their little head and you tell them how proud you are, how happy you are, how they're turning out. If you understand all that, perhaps 
some of the reluctance to talk about rewards goes away. And if it still doesn't, there's work to do. There's thinking to do because this is, this is something Jesus and his followers do talk about. It's not something that we can ignore. It's something that, it's, that we're going to have to, to find our way through and with. There was a conversation about, um, we, we talked about uh, the faith and, and living the faith and being a prophet or being righteous uh, or doing these things uh, in service to the kingdom of God. And uh, a letter came in that was just, well, it was filled with pain about how hard it is to talk to some of our brother and sister Christians about these things. That, there, that there's this block between many of us, a separation, that's a gulf that seems insurmountable, uh, uncrossable. And uh, I was reminded of, of uh, George Bernard Shaw's joke. Uh, he talked about how the United States and the United Kingdom are two countries separated by a common language that we mean very different things sometimes. And that seems to me to be exactly the situation in which we find ourselves in Christianity at this point. That there is real separation between us. And that sometimes when we talk with one another, it feels like there are hidden hooks. That unless we say this thing exactly this way, we're going to be revealed and known to be unbelievers or to have denied the faith. That it seems obvious to some of us that, that this follows necessarily from the faith while others of us are horrified that, that any faithful person would make such a link and that there's this, this mutual condemnation for each other. And we use the same words, but we mean irreconcilably different things. And it's, it's not a question of emphasis. It's not that the Methodist preacher and I have disagreements about the place of social justice. Uh, God bless the Methodist church and their insistence that we talk about such things. There are voices claiming the name of Christ, and I don't know what they're talking about. That they use the same words I use, but they go places I can't go. And when they hear me talking, they look at me like cows looking at a new gate. They have no idea what I'm talking about. They can't imagine that anyone would be so stupid or so wicked as to say the sorts of things that I'm saying. Two peoples divided by a common language. And it is so painful. It is so desperately painful sometimes. I guess, I guess I'm hoping that it's painful on the other side too. If the other side has simply written us off, the pain goes down for the moment, but the rift is so profound at that point. Let me just tell you what I do with this awareness that, that there are people who claim the name of Christ who come to vastly different understandings about the life of faith and life in this world. I try to cultivate some awarenesses. I, I think a lot about remnants in the Old Testament, uh, that very often uh, the great swap of God's people uh, would, would disobey or find themselves in error, but God always kept a few. And that there was always the seed, the yeast, for a new revival uh, of grace and hope. And so I remember that. I remember that, that part of being a Christian is to be aware of the great sweep of history um, and the democracy of the dead. The, those who lived in Christ and who died in Christ, their voices still matter in our midst. And that, that there are Christians around the world of different cultures and different settings who have different ideas and that the purpose uh, why God allows that is that we're to uh, enrich each other, that we're to, to put boundaries around each other, to, to, to discipline each other sometimes when we go too far in, in what we think, that there's all these other voices, a great choir of faith 
that helps us find our way and if we're going to do choir of faith to stay on to stay on pitch to stay in the right song for goodness sake and i remember I remember that if we're talking about popular American Christianity, right now I am absolutely a minority voice. I don't believe many of the things that are so confidently and loudly expressed. And I don't accept some of the tests of faithfulness that are laid down as necessary. If we have a different data set, if we're talking about the 500-year global Protestant Reformation, I'm still in the majority, although it's not as big a majority as it used to be. And if we're talking about the whole 2,000-year swap of history, there are things where I clearly deviate, but the center holds that I cling to the three great ecumenical creeds, that I cling to the scriptures, that I cling to the idea that we're saved by grace through faith. I believe in, in Christ alone, faith alone, uh, grace alone. And I believe in, in the power of, of God to do God's work in our midst, regardless of our understanding or our cooperation. I keep an awareness of the Bible's condemnation for false prophets, that there always are false prophets, and that there will be a reckoning there. And I try to remember that, that scripturally, those who follow God very often were not celebrated, were not popular, uh, had no, no great standing uh, among their neighbors, uh, that the, the following of God tends to be uh, poorly regarded in this world and even among those who claim God's name. And I try to remember that, that my old nature uh, is going to continue uh, to, to throw up ideas and idols that I'm, uh, I, I really do want to be loved. I really do desire acclaim. I really do want to use the Word of God to excuse my sin and to condemn yours. And I try to keep all these things in my head, in my heart, and in my prayers. But that doesn't solve the, the fundamental dilemma, does it? Because, again, these divisions that are existent among us are profound. Someone is right and someone is wrong. It's not just emphasis. It, it, someone is truly in error. And the, these awarenesses that I've just talked about, about remnants and, and the democracy of the dead and biblical prophets, that doesn't answer the question, who's right and who's wrong? Right? So I have some core commitments that I try to keep. Obviously, I think I'm right. My neighbor, who preaches and teaches something diametrically opposed to what I preach and teach, thinks he's right. What do I do? Well, if you've been paying attention in our class on Luther's Small Catechism, we cover some of that in this last lesson, Lesson 11, and I commend that to you. But I also have some core commitments that I have, that, that it is simply true that I live in a church in which there is great division about what is true and what is right. And so I try to live a life of humility. I am committed to receiving truth wherever I find it. If my enemy, political, theological, social, societal, if my enemy says something that's true, I want to be able to receive that as true and to use it as true. I do want to be committed to the, the power of relationships. That if you and I can't agree about how a certain biblical passage is to be interpreted, if we can't agree about whether or not this is literal or figurative, whether it's history or poetry, maybe we can still agree about trees or fish or baking bread 
or cheering for our kids' soccer team. And I'm committed to the best of my ability to being in it for the long haul with you, to being true to who I am, but also being aware that I have been and continue to be wrong about things and maybe you're here to help me or maybe I'm here to help you and we can't do that if we don't speak to one another, if we don't have any connections. I try to be committed uh, to, to celebrating the patience of God, that God is at work in the world long-term projects that I can't see the beginning or the end and that I simply have to trust that God has this and that I should just focus on me and my obedience and being attractive so not physically thanks be to God focus on being attractive so that people see Jesus somehow in me and that God will get this done and that God is sovereign, God is king, that, that God's will will be done and God's church will be preserved and God's truth will be known, and that my job is not to be any sort of enforcement agency. My job is to preach, teach, live, act in accordance with what I believe to be true and let God be God and judge me and judge you. There's a, a verse in Philippians that is uh, precious and terrifying to me, right? Uh, the verse is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That in a world where Christians disagree about what it means to be Christian, my job is to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. But my old nature is so slippery. My old Adam is so smart. He has so much to say. And he continues to make things muddier and harder than they need to be. Now, someone wrote in talking about this, uh, this idea uh, we talked about that part of a prophet's reward is to be vindicated, uh, that, that prophets find themselves uh, resisted, mocked, pilloried, sometimes killed, but someday vindicated. And that it's possible for us to be completely wrong, to be living wrong, talking wrong, teaching wrong, preaching wrong, believing wrong, and to think that someday I'll be vindicated. And that when angels of mercy come to us and say, what you're teaching is wrong, how you're living is wrong, we receive that true intercession as an attack and long for the day when we will be vindicated, when we will be shown to be right and those people to be wrong. Yes, we are capable of such nonsense. There are ways to watch for that. And there are ways for us, especially in community, to help one another with such temptations. That, that once I think, I, I mean, the question was, you know, you can imagine people anticipating vindication. I think that's an interesting set of words. Once I anticipate vindication, I'm probably in trouble. And almost certainly I'm facing into the dark, if not headed into the dark. That if, if I have become confident, supremely confident in my discernment and in my righteousness, I've taken my place alongside of those who resisted Jesus, who would not see the glory of God because they already knew everything they needed to know. So they thought. And once I lose my love for those I think are lost, I'm certainly a creature of darkness. So there's, there's things to, to, to do here. There's ways for us to measure where we are. If I'm sure I'm headed for a reward, I'm in trouble. And if I forget about loving you, who I think is headed for judgment, I'm headed for judgment. So for me, a deeply broken man who's trying to get things right, I anticipate not vindication, I anticipate grace, that the God who loves me in this world will continue to love me in the midst of laying out for me those things I did and said that were beneath me 
as a child of God. Those things I didn't said that brought dishonor to God's name. I anticipate that I'll be wrong about many things. I anticipate that I will have misjudged what is and isn't central and what is and isn't adiaphora, the unnecessary things. We've talked about this before. But there's, there's this great temptation in all of us to take something that's important to us and make it the center of the faith. And so we each have our own list, right? That this is central, this is central, this is central, this is central. We have 37 central things, which should give us a moment's pause, yes? And a whole bunch of things that we think are not incidental, that we think don't really matter what a Christian does with these things, with these opportunities. And I'm sure I'm wrong about some of them. I'm grounded in a tradition uh, that says that it's enough for the true unity of the church that the gospel is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly administered. And I, I cling to that. But I'm sure that one circle further out, I've made mistakes. I anticipate that I've overstated some things and neglected some things, and I anticipate that my speech, my conduct, my life have made things harder for the Spirit of God. And my guess is that a person like you watching a video like this, you're on board with most of that, if not all of that, and that you, like me, have a real hesitation to say that you're anticipating vindication, unless we're allowed to define that very carefully. If we're allowed to say that vindication means that we will be revealed to be the children of God in spite of everything that the world says and in spite of everything that we do for Jesus' sake and by his authority, great, I anticipate vindication. If it means something other than that, something darker than that, I anticipate grace. It's my only hope. And so, needing grace myself, I practice living in it with other people. I practice being both clear and loving at the same time. That can be difficult. I practice being direct and patient at the same time. And I practice letting God be God in my life and in your life, even when I think God is messing it up or needs my prompting. I don't anticipate vindication. I, indicate, I anticipate grace. And I think that changes the world. There was a, a, someone who pointed out how grateful they were that, that I said that, that nothing happening uh, in the current pandemic keeps us from being obedient, keeps us from working uh, toward the kingdom of God. And someone was, uh, was agreeing with me, which always feels nice, uh, and, uh, and, and wanting to, uh, to say that, that they accepted that as, as a true word, uh, a faithful word from God. Um, so let me, just, let me just go one step further. There is nothing happening during this pandemic that keeps you from the obedience for which you were created, to be part of the kingdom of God to be a witness for God, to bring the kingdom of God into your family, into your connections, into your employment, into your affiliations. There's nothing going on. And in fact, it might be a blessing in some ways. Under the old system, the system that we would all desperately like to get back to as soon as possible, it is possible for us, the people of God, to think that if we've gone to church, if we've sat for 60 minutes in some room someplace, that we've been obedient, that we've done what we were supposed to do. And of course, when we say it like that, it strikes us as nonsense. It, we become aware that that's not the deal at all, that, that that 60 minutes or whatever it was that we spent in that place isn't the fullness of our obedience to God isn't the mark that we're in and others who don't sit there are out. No, that 60 minutes is where we confess the things that we've messed up the previous week in our call, in our obedience, in our walk, where we receive forgiveness of sins and we receive instruction and encouragement and promises that carry us forward. Well, we can't do that 60 minutes anymore. So we don't have the possibility of thinking that doing that 60-minute hitch makes us obedient, makes us whole, makes our work complete. Nope. And yet the command to obedience remains. That we have these opportunities 
in which I hope you find a sympathetic voice, a word of grace, a word of encouragement, a word of peace, a word of forgiveness, and also a word that you're supposed to be out there. You're supposed to be working at a six foot distance, wearing a mask, but being an ambassador of, of Jesus Christ. There was uh, one final thing, a, a word of confession that, that we talked about, uh, that, that when we make Christ primary, uh, that the world will always be trying to interfere with that. And that, that nothing likes being secondary. Our families don't want to be secondary. Our employer doesn't want to be secondary. Our affiliations don't want to be secondary. Members of our clubs don't want to be secondary. Our, our neighbors don't want to feel like they're uh, in second place. And so if we make it clear in our lives and our conduct that Jesus is primary and everything else is secondary, there will be resistance. There will be pushback from that, that, that people will be attempting to regain uh, the throne of your life, the center of your attention, the, the, the heart of, of your uh, affection and provision. And someone wrote in saying that, that that's all very interesting, of course, but became aware that she does the same thing to other people that she wants to be the center of other people's lives. She wants to be noticed, she wants to be acclaimed, she wants to be received, she wants to be important, and God forgive us all, it's just true. And so my prayer for her and for you and for all of us is that Christ would be primary in our lives and that we would celebrate that primacy in the lives of one another that you become a much better friend to me as Christ leads and directs you. I become a much better neighbor to you, a much better pastor, a much better friend, much better husband, son, brother, as Christ has primacy in my life. That in a world where all things are second to Christ, there is peace and hope and possibility that doesn't exist when all things and all people are striving for primacy themselves. And so may God be known to be holy in our midst. May we be transformed. May we live at peace. May we respond to and keep the highest truth available to us and may our lives attract the lost so that the kingdom of God grows in us, through us, and among us. These are my prayers. I covet your prayers. Thanks for spending the time with me. Bye-bye.